Won't you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for once again bringing us together to worship you, Lord, in thought, word, and deed. Father, as we're here this morning, I pray that um, you encourage us to be the Christians we claim to be, Lord. Father, open our hearts and minds. Teach us to view everything we do and everything we see through the eyes of the truth of Scripture and give us the discipline to do that, Lord. I pray that, um, that my words are your words, Lord, and that what you want communicated will be communicated. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. So let me read to you. I want to read, read this scripture to you as we get started, and I want it to be hopefully floating through the back of your mind as, um, as, as we move throughout today. And hopefully by the time we get to the end, part of the reasons that I, I read this particular scripture will stick. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one that beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Welcome to week five. I feel like we've come a long way and no doubt there has been lots of information passed. Today we're going to get practical. Now that we kind of have an idea of what's going on, before we move on to the next little part of this class, um, which will be how to defend some of these issues that have come up, today we're going to get practical. What can we do to unwhack our priorities? and facilitate the relationship with our kids and those around us. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Hopefully adding some tools to your tool bag. I've used that phrase, and I hope that you that you're understand what I mean by that. Every little tool we have, there's a right tool for every job, right? And every little tool we have in our hip pocket and in our tool bag um, will go to help us get the job that we're aiming to do done correctly. And, and hopefully some of these things today will be little tools that you can use. Maybe some of this stuff you're already doing. Maybe you've heard some of this stuff before. And maybe there's a few new ideas that you can stick in your pocket for later. Please believe I'm standing here before you today talking to myself. Um, as, as I prepare these lessons, especially this one, um, I need to be constantly reminded myself of the things that we're going to be talking about today. One of the ways that I did that or do that um, is I built a library out of $1 used books, people ask me all the time, how do you, like, they're cheap, go buy them used for a dollar um, and buy them now so nobody can take them away from you, uh, which is interesting because I have a couple of books that you can no longer buy, uh, like on Amazon, because they're controversial. I leave Bibles <laughs> laying all around the house. And if this sounds funny, but verses that I need to be reminded of, ideas, I type them out on a sheet of paper and paste them to the wall. Um, a few of you have been to my house, and maybe not. Um, that helps me stay focused. Just little things that constantly keep me uh, focused on and reminded of, of who I need to be. Um, either way, I hope that today is an encouragement to be the Christian that you claim to be. It starts with us, right? We need to continue to grow in knowledge and in wisdom, sanctification, so we can handle all the stuff we talked about for the last few weeks uh, correctly, adequately, and with love. Because Christ must be first. Christ has got to come first. The first week, the very first thing we talked about was the standard, the bar, set forth by Christ in the Gospels, which is really a quote from Deuteronomy 6, love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. The bar was set. That's everything we've got. Now, of course, we're going to fall short of that. But as those in Christ, we need to be ready and willing to unwhack our priorities. Yes, I stole that from our pastor because I like it. Our priorities need to be unwhacked. Doing our best to do our Father's commands. The more we practice these disciplines, the easier they'll come. 
And by the way, the more we practice these disciplines, the easier it'll get to deal with and handle the issues that come up in our lives with our kids and our families. Like our pastor asked back in October, what would you be willing to do to prevent them from departing from the faith? And the very first week, not that you didn't know this already, but I told you it's going to cost you something. That doesn't mean life's all of a sudden going to get super easy. But like financial advisor Dave Ramsey says, and I'm paraphrasing, if you have an emergency fund, you'll find you have far less emergencies. That's not because the emergencies go away. It's because the fund is, is sitting there ready for you to use. If you have no money and you blow a transmission, you're in an emergency. If you have an emergency fund and your transmission goes, you take it to the shop and get it fixed. And it's back in a day or two. If you've ever been in a military or paramilitary type of organization, you'll be all too, familiar, all too familiar with the term muscle memory. The idea that we need to train ourselves to function in high stress environments. So when we get into those situations, we naturally know what to do. The military, paramedic school, the fire academy, the police, things like that, that's, that's what the, you do there, is learn to do the same thing over and over and over. They need to be familiar and confident with their tools so when the emergencies come, and they're going to come, you don't have to worry about how to use your tools. You, you, your body just knows what to do with it and how to handle that so you can actually do some thinking about what's really going on. Most of us do this on a pretty regular basis without noticing it. I had a whole bunch of examples to give you. I'm only going to give you one. Making the coffee in the morning. How many of you consciously think about making the coffee? Some of us can do it without even being awake, uh, almost, right? Uh, that's muscle memory. You do the same thing every day over and over and over. You wake up, you pour the water in, you get the coffee ready, and off you go. In one sense, the way we organize our lives need to reflect the same idea. What I'm not saying is we need to be little OCD robots that just move throughout our life repeating actions without thinking. Not at all. We need to be consciously working as if unto the Lord. But the more disciplined about our life we can be, the more we'll get out of our time and effort. Then when problems arise, when these conversations come up, we'll be emotionally and spiritually ready to handle them. This, by the way, is going to rub off on our kids. Our kids see us. Our pastor reminded us back in November that our kids become like us, for better or for worse. Remember this quote? This haunted me. Even what's done in the dark that the people don't see influences them. I think about that all the time. He was, now, he was speaking of our sins, which is very true. Even our sin processes come out. But it works in reverse. They see what's important to us. That's a little kind of what today is about. They see what's important to us and they follow suit. They'll want to do, in most cases, what we want to do. Now, that, when they're younger, that is magnified because they literally just don't ever want to leave your side, right? And they want to do everything that you want to do. But again, like we were reminded, even when they don't want to do what we want to do, we all become our parents, don't we? Um, I can look back and be like, yep, yeah, that's that that just happened. Um, so that's what's going to happen when you live closely with people. So here's the number one tip. Make Christ the priority. In all that you do. Not sports, not entertainment, not money, not jobs. Christ. Now those things I mentioned aren't bad things. It's okay to enjoy watching the game with your family. But it's not okay to miss worshiping God in church on the Lord's Day because you're at a ball field. It's okay to work hard and to build your career so you can provide for your family, put food on the table, and have a reasonable roof over your head. But it's not okay if you're missing time with the body of Christ and with your family to work 10 to 15 hours a day, seven days a week, so you can have the biggest house on the block and the most brand new motorhome and take Dis Disneyland vacations once a year. We need to have Christ as our priority and look to what he says on how to spend our time, our money, and our energy. 
Time and energy, by the way, is going to affect your kids more than any dollar you ever spend on them. Doing this well will benefit the relationship that you're trying to build. We're, we're building a relationship here from kind of day one. And how we spend our time and energy is going to play out when we go to have these conversations when they're 15, 16, 17, and hopefully, and hopefully on. But that'll make future conversations easier and smoother. But if you're saying that Christ is your priority and you're spending Sunday mornings on a ball field, they're not going to believe you. If you try to sit down with them and explain that the Bible is true and accurate and we need to live according to what it says, but they've never seen you open your Bible and read it at home, no, your phone doesn't count. They're not going to listen. Christ must be the priority in everything that you do. We can't expect our kids to do as we say and not as we do. That, that just doesn't work, especially now in the society that we're living in. So we've been saying this since day one, we need to be people of prayer. That's how we fight our battles, first and foremost. Pray is mentioned between three and 700 times in the Bible, depending on translation. R.C. Sproul says, the sovereign God commands by his holy word that we pray. Prayer is not optional for the Christian. It is required. In Philippians, we're told, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How pleasant of a verse is that to read and to remember? Prayer is displayed to us as valuable and important in scriptures. Mark 135, many of you know this verse um, from discipleship groups. By the way, if you're not in a discipleship group, why are you not? There's plenty of room. We'll, we'll figure that out. So get in one. Mark 135 says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. The he, of course, is Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. If Jesus found it important to take time to pray, shouldn't we do the same? Our pastor says this, our lack of prayer is a silent declaration that we don't need God. So let's get practical. Prayer should become as natural as breathing. And it can be a real big, heavy, fat, difficult like topic to deal with. And people get nervous around prayer. It doesn't have to be that way. It should be our natural go-to state, muscle memory. The more we do it, the more natural it's going to become to do it. If we spend time developing this skill, often and regularly in our everyday lives, when we really need it and don't quite know what to do, that reflex will just occur. That's what's just going to happen. I have these moments all the time. Uh, just, just last year, you receive a phone call at 3 in the morning um, that a family member just passed away. And what do you do? This is what you do. You pray. But if you don't exercise that skill, then when the difficult co times come, or the praiseworthy times come, by the way, it's not all about difficulty all the time. Like the Lord blesses us all, and we should have our eyes open to that and be thanking him on a regular basis. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Get stuck on the T. Because we're in a highly emotional state and we haven't developed that muscle, those, those times are going to pass us by. I know many of us in this room probably have heard people that really aren't churchgoers. Uh, you know, maybe they're Christians, maybe they're not. This isn't a judgment, but they're only on their knees praying when bad things happen. And then they come to you and say, well, I've been praying. Like, I, I don't know why. It, well, if that's the only time you, you pray in your life is when you're asking God to give you something. Uh, and then you're wondering why it's not going so well. Well, so here's a few tips on how to if you get stuck. I like these. They're little things you can stick in your pocket. Um, and, and again, some of you are, have heard these all before. Hopefully it's an encouragement to keep using them. But the first and foremost is keep it simple. It's a little acronym, KISS. Um, there's an extra S at the end that I don't include. Um, those of you guys who are smiling. Um, but keep it simple. If you're new to prayer, which again, I'm not speaking to the people in this room at this time, but if you're new to prayer or you're stressed out or you're tired, this happens to me all the time. Just at the end of the day, 
you have kids, you have a life, you have a job, you had to drive on the freeway in California, um, you're done by the end of the day. Keep it simple. Our Father wants us to talk and share with Him, just like we want our kids to talk and share with us. What an amazing opportunity we have to sit and share with the King of Kings, who we get to call Abba. He wants to hear from us, just like our parents want to hear from us, and just like we want to hear from our kids. So keep it simple. How many of you have ever gotten super frustrated with a little five-year-old kid that sat down next to you um, and just shared something that was going on in their life? Nobody, right? What an honor that they wanted to talk to us. So keep it simple. The next one, and I, most of the people in this room I know know this already, and, but I'm going to say it anyway and we'll keep it short, is the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. If you haven't, I'm glad to share it with you because this, this is the acronym that I probably use the most in my life. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So real quickly, um, it, you don't have to do it in this order, uh, but it's a great acronym to keep and it's a great way to pray. We spend time right off the beginning praising God for who he is and what he's done, adoring him. Don't forget to confess your sins. Don't get so wrapped up with what's going in life that you're not running to him, uh, confessing your sins. And then, by the way, thanking him for being faithful to forgive. Then we move on to Thanksgiving. I mentioned this (laughs) just a minute ago, but getting stuck on the tea. Um, I I love getting stuck on the tea because Thanksgiving how many of us, I don't care where you are, whether you're watching this in the future, um, look around you. Be thankful for the air you breathe in and out. It's that simple. We all have so much to be thankful for. Feel free to get stuck on the T. And then supplication. This is a time to, to ask God for things, rem- remembering to ask for them according to his will, to share with him what's going on in our lives. Again, he wants to hear from us. Yes, he knows what we're going to pray before that we pray it, but he wants us to be in that relationship with him. It's a relationship forming thing. And hopefully um, our will is being molded to his through this process. So we have kiss. Keep it simple. Acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And SIP. This one I picked up a handful of years ago. It stands for specifically, intelligibly, and purposefully. Don't forget, even though this is our Abba and he wants us to talk to him and we need to keep it simple, don't forget that you're approaching the creator, the king of kings. It's important to remember that. So be specific with your prayers. He's a great big old God and he can handle whatever it is that you have to say. Use adult words. Use true words. Don't try to mask your sin processes or your praise. Be honest. Be specific. Be intelligible about what you're saying. This is one of those times where writing down your prayers might come in handy. Um, Read them. Uh, Write them down beforehand and think them through and read it off the paper as you're praying to him. And be purposeful about what you're praying for or asking for. Um, I, I, I tend to kind of lump this sip into the supplication part of Acts, uh, because as I approach him with my desires, my hopes, um, I want to be specific. I'm going to make my case. Now you're going to get told no uh, sometimes, uh, but the prayers will be answered. Um, and I, I want to go to him and let him know this is something that I've thought through. I've, I've thought through it. I've read what scripture says, and I, I need you involved in this, Lord. And then we have praying scripture. I don't have a fancy acronym for this one. Um, this is, again, something that I didn't learn to do until late in life, and that makes me sad, uh, but that's all right. God puts us where he wants us. But pray through scripture. What an amazing tool the actual Bible is to use to pray through. And let me give you a couple of ways that maybe you haven't thought of before. First, we know that... The Bible does show us how to, right? The, in the Lord's Prayer, not the Lord's, not the actual Lord's Prayer that we're going through on Thursday nights. But when, but when Christ is asked, how do we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, right? Okay, this is a rubric of how to pray. You don't have to pray those exact words every time you pray. But that, that prayer actually kind of follows Acts, um, if you read through it. So it shows us how to pray. It gives us examples, We also can learn how to pray by reading the prayers in Scripture that God kept for us in there. All throughout 
scripture, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you find people talking to God, praying. Sometimes they're yelling at God and making their case. How did they pray? What was the outcome of those prayers? Uh, We have the 66 books of the canon right here, and those prayers that God chose to include in here, we can learn from. By the way, like we mentioned before, some of those prayers are prayers from God the Son to God the Father. So learning to model our prayers after the prayers that Scripture shows us are important, like the prayers of the Son of God, uh, is, is one way that you can use Scripture to pray it. And maybe go through and highlight them. I I've did this in a Bible, just a cheap Bible. I started going through and highlighting prayers. Just when I see them, this is a prayer. Let me see what this guy has to say and how he's saying it. And then um, simply uh, just praying through Scripture, letting Scripture open up for you. Um, what might need to be prayed for. I use the Psalms as my example for this. You don't have to use the Psalms. This works in whatever part of portion of Scripture you're in. But we should be praying before we open the Bible and after we close our Bible. Um, but one of those little prayers as you open up the Bible, hey, Lord, I really show me what I need to be in prayer for. And maybe as you're reading through the Psalms, again, because that's one of the easiest for me. Those are really worshipful moments. But as you're reading through the book of Romans uh, and you're whatever the case may be is the Holy Spirit may just kind of tag a couple of things in the back of your mind, jot those down and pray about it. What, what were you enlightened to as you were, well, did somebody come to mind as you were reading through these scriptures? Pray for them or pray for that situation. So pray through scripture. Here's a few practical ways how to incorporate prayer into your life. Like we said in the very beginning, some people just really struggle. And I understand, I was talking to our pastor yesterday. Um, This is an area that I feel blessed. I have grown considerably because for the first most of my life, prayer just wasn't a thing. I didn't spend much time doing it. And now it's like the only thing I want to do. Uh, It's it's on it, not because I'm a great guy. It's the only place I feel safe, to be honest with you. Because when I'm talking to the Lord and on my knees, nothing bad can happen. Um, And then you open your eyes and the real world is all around you. Uh, and the real world right now is difficult to handle. Um, so get comfortable praying. But here's a few things that I have done in my life or things that I've stumbled across on practical ways. First of all, your Bible. We just talked about that, right? Use, use this. Read it. Be involved with it often and pray through it as you're reading. Number two, and I don't usually bring this up here. It's on airplane mode. Almost everybody has one of these within arm's reach right now. Most of us spend a lot of the time of day staring right at this. Start using it for the Lord. It has note-taking capabilities. It has alarms. Um, I did this years and years ago until it became so natural that I didn't need the alarm anymore. It'll buzz at you every four hours. Set an alarm on your iPhone and it'll buzz at you. Pray. No matter where you are, stop and take 30 seconds to pray until that just becomes a natural habit. Again, you can take notes. You can use your Google Drive to keep your prayer list in so it's with you wherever you go. Start using things like this to the benefit of the Lord. Um, Meals. That that really is two to three times a day, depending on how often and when you eat, that you can at least spend a few seconds thanking and praising the Lord for who He is and what He's given you. These are times that um, can be easy to forget because you're busy. You're moving through life. You've got kids all over the place. One of them's got to get to sports. One of them's got to get to here. Um, And sometimes we forget to to spend a minute. It doesn't matter whether you are. I'm the worst at doing this in restaurants, and I need to be better about it. Um, It does happen when we think about it. My kids actually remind me more often than anything else. Hey, shouldn't we pray? Um, And I love that because I'm bad at that. It's something I need to be reminded of. So the Lord put them in my life. Set aside time to pray with your family. Pray with your kids. They're not too young. I don't care how old they are. They're not too young. Pray with them. Show them how. You show them. Show them how it works. Pray through acts with them. Talk through it before you actually get to the the prayer part. Um, Hey, these are the things that, you know, we're going to pray for. Teach them. Um, Teach them what those words mean. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And, And let them pray. Let them pray out loud. They, they can't do it poorly. Even if they're five, if they can get out two words, they can do it. They can pray. So you show them. Maybe meals is the only time that your family has to do this. I, re- I realize that my family's on the younger side, so we're all together quite a bit. 
And it gets harder and harder to be together and to set aside time to pray and to read scripture together as a family as they get older and as they start moving out around this world. But make sure you're setting time to setting time aside to pray with your kids. Maybe, again, meals is the only time to do this. If you're not eating together as a family once a day, why not? Now, there are solid reasons why maybe you cannot do that. This is not a judgment. I'm just asking a question that hopefully you'll stick in the back of your head. Why are we not doing that? Where are our priorities? What are they? Um, because most often the reasons that I've gotten in the past for the reasons that we don't sit down and eat a meal together aren't good reasons. Meal times are great opportunities to spend with your family. When you say you're going to pray for somebody, stop and do it right then. This was a life changing. I, I don't even know why that didn't occur to me when I was younger until I was like 35. I mean, it might have been pastor that mentioned this. Like, if you say you're going to pray for him, stop right, right now. Hey, you got 30 seconds. That's all it takes. And pray right then. And then as they pop up in your head throughout the week, stop what you're doing and pray. You know, it doesn't have to be some big fancy moment in church where you're praying. You can pray wherever you're at and do it right then. And prayer meetings. We are all blessed to have a church that offers corporate prayer together. Believe it or not, this is... I believe the first church that I've ever been to that offers that, and I've been attending church for my whole life, uh, which is sad. It's mind-blowing. But, but I'm blessed. We're, we are blessed to have this church. If your church, um, if you're watching this and your church isn't doing that, talk to the pastor and you start a prayer meeting. But we offer prayer uh, every Sunday morning. Uh, before the service starts from 9.30 to 10. That's an excellent time. They write prayers down for us. Bring your kids in there. Let them listen. They don't, tell, they don't have to talk. Just let them listen to the prayers of their elders and their deacons and you, your parents, those around. Every, uh, what is it, fourth Sunday, we have a prayer meeting after. We share a meal and pray. Take those opportunities to pray. Take those opportunities to spend that time with the Lord. Are you struggling with a decision? Age appropriately, but pray about it together. When you're blessed with something, some situation, pray about it. When you're sad or something hard in life happens, pray about it. When you have a death in the family, pray about it. When you have a birth in the family, pray about it. When you open your Bibles, pray about it. When you close your Bibles, pray about it. When you go to bed, pray about it. Yes, it's okay to fall asleep praying. He stole that from me. No, he mentioned that on Thursday night, and I'm glad that he did. Um, because, I, once again, I almost have felt honor in my life when my little two- or three-year-old kid's sitting down at the end of the day, and they're really super tired, and they fall asleep in my arms. It's okay to fall asleep talking to your father. So pray at the end of your day. Don't feel guilty about that. Don't not pray because you're afraid that you're going to fall asleep now, I do want to say the star, star, star caveat to that is if the only time you're praying, you're falling asleep, maybe we need to look at our priorities. But it is okay to fall asleep praying. Are you getting it? Set aside time for formal prayer, whether that is 10 minutes or an hour every day. It doesn't matter. So you've got to start somewhere. But also continuously pray throughout the day. Your prayers don't always have to be all of acts. I call them little one-offs. When the Holy Spirit does something in you, I know you all know what I'm talking about. Pray about it. Don't waste that opportunity. He brought that into your mind for a reason. Take 20 seconds. Uh, if you're on the freeway, don't close your eyes. Uh, but pray. You know, like I, I know guys that that's what they do during their commute is pray. Um, pray about it. This is going to impact you and your relationship with your creator. This is going to impact you and your relationship with your kids. This is going to display to those who are closest to you, especially those that live in your home, what is important to you. And that is going to impact them for their whole lives. Prayer is a big subject and there's about 100,000 million, I didn't do the actual math on that, books about it. Um, I'm just going to give you guys a couple of quick resources that have impacted me and helped me with some of these spiritual disciplines. 
um, and especially prayer, since that's what we're talking about at the moment. So this guy, Richard J. Foster, I love his stuff. Um, again, I wish I would have read it earlier. Prayer is one chapter in this book. Same guy, whole book. Um, but this one talks about all the spiritual disciplines. This one is, is specifically on prayer. They'll be in the back um, at the end. But those are two books that really have impacted me, and I've pulled a lot from them. This book by Donald Whitney is called Praying the Bible. And it's essentially what the title says it is, learning how to pray through the Bible, giving you tips and tricks on how to do that. Um, and uh, by the way, our own discipleship material, once again, if you're not in a discipleship group, why not? Uh, but our pastor has put together an entire book of discipleship material on prayer that you can pick up, get yourself in a group to do that. And these two, um, so nine marks, Mark, Mark Deaver, although he's not the author of this particular book, there's, there's like nine or 10 of these little books. They're almost booklets. So they're real easy reads that'll help you understand, uh, how church works and how being a, you know, prayer is one of them. So pick up this little book and, I know there's tons and tons of information. Um, the Value of Vision. If you're not familiar with this book, uh, this is essentially a bunch of Puritan prayers written down. I do not pray these prayers as my own, but what I do do, and it's crazy how often this happens when I'm really struggling um, with what words to say, what to pray, you know, especially when it comes to adoration. How, how can I praise the Lord in this situation? Some Puritan a couple hundred years ago wrote down a prayer that has like the exact emotions I'm feeling in it. And it really helps me put words to my own thoughts and emotions as I pray. Um, so those are some, some of the resources that have impacted me in my prayer life, if you're interested, because uh, we need to be readers. So saints, be people of prayer. Make that more a part of your life. Make it so natural that that's just your natural go-to state. Next, let's talk about the Bible. Like we mentioned in the beginning, if, we, if we're telling those that we're in conversations with, our kids especially, um, that we need to do what this says and the Bible says so and they've never seen us open it, they're not going to believe us. Just a few weeks ago at Bible study on Thursday night, if you weren't there, why not? Thursday nights, 7 o'clock. Uh, and you can catch the message on YouTube if you haven't seen it. But one of our deacons, Mr. Lemos, spent the evening reminding us that we're to read, study, and meditate on Scripture. He said to remind us of the importance of God's Word and the privilege it is for us to know and grow in grace as we study and gain understanding. I love the word privilege that he used uh, because very few humans in history have had this. It'll be there in a day. For $100, you can have five translations, solid translations of the Bible that'll show up at your door tomorrow morning. Very few humans still to this day have that ability. What a privilege to have the entire canon. I'm not going to repeat everything he said. Instead, I'm going to encourage you to go back and watch his lesson. It was um, two or three weeks ago. Next week, we're going to spend some time learning about defending the Bible, actually why we believe it's true and how the canon came across. But today, let's get practical. Just like with prayer, the more we do it, the more natural it's going to become. Uh, this isn't even in my notes, um, and I have to be careful because I'm going to go long anyway. But uh, this, this thought just, just came up from an apologist named Amy Hall, who's an amazing, she's, she's a great apologist. And she reminded us that reading the Bible can be similar to reading any other novel. And what she meant by that is um, that the more you read your favorite novel, the more familiar with it you come, become and the more things open up inside it. It works the same way. The more you read it, the more familiar with it you're going to become. The more you're going to see. The more that you do this, the easier it'll get to be consistent in your own faith in the truth, and to spot the inconsistencies that you're going to come across, whether that be with a progressive church, um, a question that a kid or a family member asks. But make a point to sit down every day and read the Bible. That sounds simple enough. Right? I almost didn't write this in, in my notes because of the group that I'm talking to. But how many of us are really dedicated to doing that, if we're honest with ourselves, taking the time to sit down and open our Bibles every day. Before we talk about how to, I want to take just a second uh, 
to make a case for having an actual physical Bible. So I'm not speaking down about digital Bibles by no stretch of the imagination. I think that it's amazing that you can carry around almost every translation of the Bible with you, including multiple languages of translations in your pocket. And when you're standing in line at the DMV, you can take that out. It'll read the Bible to you. Fantastic tool. I want to make a case for your number one uh, tool when it comes to biblical reading to be an actual physical Bible. So first of all, you have the weight of the canon. This is something that you do not get with a digital Bible. When you open a Bible, you see the whole thing. You see the Old Testament and the New Testament. You see the verses before and after. And I call that the weight of the canon. Because when you're looking at a phone, all you see is three verses or four verses, depending on how small you have the font. And it gets real easy to forget that there's more there. Your brain engages differently with this than it does with your phone. Because you use your phone to do your taxes and to do your driving and to make your meals and, 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 and. This you use to engage with the creator. Notes and legacy. This Bible is 120 years old, um, and it's an old family Bible, and you cannot do this with your phone. I wish that it had more writing in it. I really do. But this is an old family Bible that I had passed down to me because I'm a Bible guy. Um, and I'm honored to have it. I'll never change the cover. But you cannot leave a bio, your phone Bible to your kids. I really hope my kids want my Bibles. They've already started picking out the ones they're going to keep. Because uh, I write in them. I hope that I get my grandfather someday. Although he's got a couple of sons. so <laughs> It's a visual sign of importance. Once again, digital is distracting. This is a visual sign of importance. Your phone sitting on the counter is not. As you read it, it's a visual sign of importance to not only you, but those around you. Leave it out. Don't put it on a shelf. Don't put it in a drawer. Leave it out. Have more than one. Have one on your nightstand and one on your table and one on your counter. Don't stick it in a drawer, you, you know? It just gets too easy to ignore throughout the week. It's God's word and we're blessed to have it. We're blessed to have the whole counsel of God. One of the best reasons I had given to me years and years ago to have and use a physical Bible instead of a digital Bible is this. And once I tell you, you can't unhear this. When you read a digital Bible, all your kids see is you looking at your phone once again. They don't know what you're doing. They don't know what you're reading. They know you're ignoring them to stare at your phone. Even if you actually are reading the Bible, that's not what they see. Digital things are distracting. So have and use a Bible. That I can actually help you with. Um, if you ever have questions on physical Bibles and what comes in them, and since you can't walk into a store and peruse them yourself, please feel free to ask um, at any time, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. But make it a priority in your day. When questions get asked, include in the conversation what Scripture says. And when possible, open up to it and read those Scriptures. Read it with your family all the time. Don't worry about whether or not they're going to get it. They'll get what they get, just like we're going to get what we're going to get. The Holy Spirit does the work, right? I get asked a lot, what Bible should I get my kids at all ages? My kid just graduated from high school. What Bible should I get him? Just get them a normal Bible. Uh, this happens to be an area that I've had good conversations with our pastor about, and we totally see eye to eye on this, like, I'm not super into kids' Bibles uh, because a lot of times they get stuff wrong. They water it down so much that God's intended meaning isn't there anymore. Not on purpose. I'm, I'm not harping on them. They're, they're really trying to bring the Word of God to kids. But they get things wrong. Because the account of David and Goliath isn't about us facing our giants. Adam and Eve didn't eat an apple. And Jonah wasn't in a whale. Okay? What does this have to do with anything? Why does this matter? Because in 15 or so years, after believing all those things that they were taught that are incorrect, some professor is going to bring it up and point out that everything they believe is inaccurate. And it's going to be true because they're going to open their Bible and think, if they taught me all this untrue stuff, what else did they get wrong? So just read them the Bible. When we read to them from the word of God, it can't be wrong. Just reading them the scriptures will also help open up all kinds of opportunities to talk to our kids about very difficult 
things, very difficult subjects and conversations. Having trouble talking to your kids about physical intimacy within marriage? Start reading the Old Testament. Your problems will not go away, but uh, they will open up all kinds of opportunities. Then let them ask questions. Let the Bible start the conversation and you be ready to answer the questions because they're going to come. How do we get, excuse me, how do we get answers to hard Bible questions? We study and we become familiar with it. Again, one of our leaders, Mr. Franco, don't we have an amazing set of leaders here, by the way? Mr. Franco delivered a fantastic message a couple of Sundays ago, and in the beginning, he encouraged us to use a commentary. I can't go too, too into what a commentary is because he did a great job. You can go back and watch the beginning of his sermon. Um, But a commentary can help us understand difficult passages. It's what exegetes, remember exegesis and hermeneutics, okay? They exegete the scripture and they're experts on the language and the culture so we get in context what the, what's really happening because we interpret the parts in light of the whole. So have commentaries. like Just like he said, our pastor can give you uh, great examples, great uh, references on which commentaries if you're going through a particular book of the Bible to use. But have them. So let's get practical. First, get a solid Bible that you're going to use often and get to know it. Make sure you like it. This one sounds funny, but liking your Bible makes a difference. Just like liking anything in our lives makes a difference. When you get a new car, that's all you want to do is drive around in your new car. If you have to strain to read the font, you may not pick it up as often. If it doesn't lay open in a comfortable way in your hand or on your lap, you may not pick it up as often. I realize it sounds petty, but we're being practical here today. And these things make a difference to us as humans. So get a Bible that you like and that you're going to read and spend time in. Make notes in it. Whether you use pencil or highlighter or pen, it doesn't matter. If you're not a writer and you don't want to write in your Bible, I got 10,000 ways you can take notes. I'd be happy to explain more about translations later, but I'd recommend New King James Version. That's the translation that this church uses. I've had a couple of questions on that in the recent past. It's a solid formal equivalent or word-for-word translation. Again, I'm more than happy to explain to you that if you have questions on translation differences. But that's what we use, and since that's what we use, we might as well all be reading the same thing. That being said, um, translations like the English Standard Version or the New American Standard Bible, uh, those are also solid formal equivalents that, that can be studied from. Have a plan. I know you've heard this the last like three months at this church, and it remains true. Have a plan. You need to be taking in the whole counsel of God regularly, not just the New Testament, not just the Old Testament, not just Romans, the whole counsel of God regularly. Everybody does it at a different pace, and that's okay. But have a plan. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. There's lots of, lots of different ways you can do this. Some Bibles have a plan right in the back. You can buy a one-year Bible. I'm just going to give you three. Our website, gbcmpk.org, has, a, I think it's a four-year Bible reading plan, right? Um, so if you want to do it in four years, that's little chunks, and you, you read it more than once kind of um, through. But it's a, great, it's a great option if you want to go through that. Ligonier.org, uh, I've mentioned this website a lot. You should have it bookmarked on your computer already. Um, they put out reading plans once a year. I wish they would do it in like November. It's usually like January, the first week of January. But every year they put out new reading plans for the new year, and there's usually five or six of them in that email, and it will take you through in six months or a year, or you want to do the Gospels twice. There's a handful of them that you can choose. And this last one is really cool, and I had a friend of mine recommend it to me, and I checked it out. It's just a Bible reading plan generator. So I have a website that is a Bible reading plan generator. You put in what you want to read, it spits out your plan. So I want to read the whole thing in six months. Boom, here's your plan. I want to read on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Here's your plan. It's pretty cool. So there's lots of options. There's no excuse to not have a plan and to not be taking in the whole counsel of God regularly. The Bible has 1,189 chapters in it. If you read only 11 to 13 chapters a day, that puts you all the way through, cover to cover in about three and a half months. And in reality, that's only about 30 minutes to an hour a day. That's it depending on days that have Psalm 119 in it. 
that day's going to take you a little longer. We all know like Isaiah and Jeremiah, some of these chapters get crazy, crazy long. But for the most part, 30 minutes to an hour a day, and you can do it in three and a half months. That's nothing, folks. Many of us are spending far more time than that watching TV or even sitting on the freeway. Again, use your version app on the freeway. It'll read it to you for free. Leave that Bible out on a table. If you have a plan and you have a comfortable Bible that you enjoy, leave it out. Seeing it out will help remember, remind you and help you stay focused to be motivated to sit down and actually study. It'll help you stay motivated when your kids start asking you questions to open the Bible. Take small bites. This is, I think this is a really important piece of advice, especially if you're talking to new Christians, especially if you're talking to kids. Take small bites. Don't bite off more than you can chew because that's just going to lead to discouragement. And as humans, we start to get discouraged and you start to get behind and you just quit. If you only have 15 minutes, that's fine, but start there. Be diligent, be dedicated, and have a plan. We need to be spending regular time in the Word studying Scripture. Before I wrap up, I just want to touch on this. We need to be readers. That's all there is to that. Uh, if you're not a reader, become one. Uh, that's the best. Of, that's only, the only way I can word that is start. Start practicing. Reading is how we learn. So start building a list of quality books that can help you learn about the situations you're going through. Learn about how to understand this particular text a little bit better. Whatever the case may be is get quality resources that you're facing and read them. Don't wait to read them until you're in the middle of the problem. Read them ahead of time. Do your best to foresee. To, if you have questions, start now. Your pastor and the deacons and elders can help you with this. Uh, Ligonier is another site that can help you build a list of books uh, and the, the direction to guide you in certain questions that you have. There's always little books listed at the bottom of their web pages. I can help you with this, but we can't help if you don't ask. Don't waste your time reading books that don't have solid information in them. Uh, we just don't have that kind of time. So get good, solid recommendations from the pastor. Um, go to Ligonier and start reading some of their stuff. As we start closing here, I want to talk to you about actually having those conversations. We talked about the spot the lie game. It doesn't have to be money-based, although if you have a bunch of quarters laying around, you know, and, and your kids are into quarters, I guess quarters don't buy you much these days. But if you start using your pause button and asking your kids what just happened, you might be surprised at what they pick up on. So start looking for those teachable moments. In order to spot those teachable moments, you're going to have to be aware of what's going on around you at all times. My example of this is a baking show. I think that I kind of gave, gave you guys this example before, but the first time my kids were exposed to a same-sex relationship was watching a baking show. She was like six years old. Now, we were blessed to be out in front of this, and, and my oldest was six, and she was familiar with what marriage was, and she asked, like, because we had had conversation about biblical marriage, and then some guy rattled off, be aware of those teachable moments. Press pause. Spot the lie. Hey, what's being told to you here? What's the world trying to sell you? When you walk into Kohl's, point out the mannequins and ask them, what is wrong with that? Because you're going to see mannequins that are not right. Like the things that they're wearing these days, the clothes, the simple clothes, at least in the female section. I don't shop in the guys section because I have little girls. <laughs> um, but it's out there. So be ready to spot the lie. Ask your kids questions and be ready to listen. Bath time is a great time to do this with little ones um, because it's, it's an intimate time between mom and kids or whatever the case may be is, and you can discuss things about the body. You can discuss things about relationships at an age-appropriate level. You can answer the questions that they have throughout the day. As they get too old for bath times, meal times. We talked about this once already. Meal times is a great time to do this with everybody. Hey, what's going on in your day? What did you hear? What did you learn you know, at, at your job if they're old enough to have a job um, and have a discussion about those? Your kids and friends will be looking for your reaction. That will dictate their continued willingness to share. Just like when babies fall down. When babies fall down, if you've ever been around little toddlers, they kind of look around to see what you're doing. <laughs> right? Like, so if you freak out and scream and, and stand up and run over there, they're going to kind of freak out and scream whether they're hurt or not. But yay, you know, a lot of us learn to clap when they fall down. 
Um, and they look around and they're like, yay. And they say, they're looking for your reaction. What do I do? What's mom and dad doing? That's what I should be doing. So don't forget, your reaction will dictate their continued willingness to share. Don't get caught like a deer in the headlights. Be ready to say, hey, tell me a little more about that. What did you mean by that? Can you, I, I've never heard that term before. And then let them carry the conversation on as you answer questions that come up. And then listen. Listen, listen, listen. It's okay to not know the answer. But know at least the direction you need to go to find the answer. You have a pastor that can help you with that. I'll do my best with the information that I have. You have elders and deacons that, you know, there are people around Ligonier.org is a place you can go to to get some of these, to get help to point you in the right direction. But be ready to listen. It's not okay to just put a book in their hand because they're not going to read it. You read it. And then you share the information with them. At the very least, if they are readers, read it together. All too often, parents come up at apologetics conferences and stuff and ask these apologists, what book can I give my kid? There isn't one. You're the book. You read it. Facilitate the relationship. This is an all-day, everyday thing. You cannot give up. You cannot let down. I know it sounds daunting. Run full out. Leave nothing on the field. If you're living the Christian life, live it with all-out commitment. Don't give up. Don't quit. Train hard. Don't settle. Run to win, saints, like we read in the beginning. Yes, that sounds hard, and some days it's, it's going to be difficult, and there are going to be days, maybe like today, where you're like, oh, i got to do all this stuff and reorganize my whole life. Rely on the strength of the Lord. Trust in the Lord's strength to empower you to stay in the fight. He enables his own to keep on going. So I want to leave you with this. Isaiah 40, 27 says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us guidance. Thank you so much for, first of all, waking us up to be here. Lord, we care about our kids. Keep them close to you. Teach us how to lead them. Lord, make us better Christians, and in so doing, make us better parents. Father, enable us throughout the week when Sunday's over um, to not forget to read on Monday. Lord, when the prayer meetings are over on Sunday, draw us ever closer to you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday to talk to you and to worship you and to live our lives as if unto you, Lord, and fill us up. Fill us up so that those who bump into us get splashed with you. Thank you so much for this time we've had together, Lord. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. I know it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot today. I hope again that you guys are encouraged. Um, I know that the people in this room, in my opinion, are ahead of the curve on a lot of this stuff, but it's important to be reminded of. Um, I do a lot of the things that we talked about <laughs> because I need to be reminded of it. I find on the weeks that I go home and stick my Bible somewhere where I don't usually have it, it gets just too easy to forget. Um, so if you have any questions, there was a lot of things that kind of came up today that was like, a, hey, if you have questions afterward about translations, about Bibles, if you're looking for a Bible, um, those are questions that I can help you with. As far as translations and books and all that stuff, our pastor and our elders are more than happy to help out with that kind of stuff. And if you have any questions, I have a few minutes left.
Yes, sir. I don't have so much a question as a comment, and I love the way you, you kind of flesh it out. Um, I'm not sure if it was uh, either Dr. MacArthur or, or uh, Sproul, because those are the two agents. <laughs> um, so don't read good books on scripture, or don't read good Christian books. Read the best Christian books. And I really yes. like that you emphasize that. Don't just go out and get the, the latest and the greatest, even though it may be a good book. But uh, and, and I like that you you're using yourself as a resource, and, and of course, different to our pastor as well, because he'll you guys are well read. And I love that you've noticed that, and that they've said that. And I was even convicted. I think it was Zephaniah a couple of books ago. Um, I, so it wasn't too long ago, a pastor was preaching on Zephaniah, I think, and he mentioned, don't waste your time reading good books. And I know I mentioned last week my heresy shelf. Um, I have that shelf for a purpose. Uh, but, man, it was so convicting thinking, we just don't have the time. I, I, I don't have the time. And sometimes resources can be difficult. Uh, and that's why I mentioned things like the pastor and Ligonier. Um, read the best ones because why muddy the waters uh, with all that other stuff. There's guys that comment on books and will give you a little, Tim Chalice is another name that he reviews a lot of books and he's a solid Christian guy. And so you can go read the review of the book and oh no, I, I don't need, because he'll tell you, you know, I don't need to waste my time. Pastor will do that same thing um, because there's a hundred thousand books on a hundred thousand subjects. So just read the, read the best ones. Um, so it's important. Anything else? Well, it's, yeah. Just a quick comment. I, you made me think when you when, uh, you showed us that 120-year-old Bible. Uh, I was at a, a, an event one time where the man said, you know, you, someday your Bible is going to be found by your great-great-grandchildren. Yep. And they'll wonder, did, did great-great-grandfather know Christ? Or did he use it to press flowers? Yeah. He said, write your testimony out. Right. <laughs> put it in your Bible and keep it there so that 100 years from now, you could be a legacy to uh, great great grandchildren you don't even know. Uh, yes. Of your faith in Christ. That's a great thing to keep in mind. Um, have a couple of them. If you have a couple of kids, have a couple of Bibles. Jot down notes inside them. Because, like I said, this one's 120 years old. It's a family Bible. It has very little written in it. It's a King James Version, Sunday School Teachers Edition, if you want to um, thumb through it. It's interesting to read. But I wish that it had more written in there. Because I want to know what they were going through. I want to see what what they were reading when they pulled out scripture um and so i try to consciously i'm not so much of a writer in the bible anymore although i used to be i take my notes digitally but i think of exactly what you just said my digital notes aren't going to be there for my kids so i have bibles that i specifically write prayers and you can get interleaved bibles that every other page is blank um at, you use it to journal you know one other a caveat to that was when my father was uh, very sick and was terminal yeah. cancer. He and I sat down because I thought, I want this to be his legacy. I want to help him with this kind of in a covert way. I said, tell me your testimony one more time. And so he shared his testimony. Then I wrote it out and I sent it to him. I said, I just thought you'd want to see this and edit it if you want. He said, I'll leave it exactly the way you wrote it. That's great. And when he passed away, I gave it to the pastor to, that was going to be the officiator you know, at his uh, memorial service. And then he turned to me and he said, I want you to read it. Yeah. And I was, uh, you know, a little scary, but I was so glad that I moved on that uh, leading of the Holy Spirit to do what this pastor had shared at a public event. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was a very uh, a poignant moment in his memorial service yeah. because I was... He, I was sharing his life with the people that were there, how he perceived his walk towards Christ and then his walk after being born again. What a cool testimony. And that's part of what I'm hoping gets communicated with leave your Bibles out, write in them, have something to leave to your kids. You just can't do that with a phone, you know. All right, it is prayer time, right, every Sunday morning at 930. So uh, if you have further questions up here, I'm more than willing. Um, but let's be people of prayer. Mm -hmm.